Welcome back. I'm Maggie, your host of Neighbors Helping Neighbors, the podcast from Father Joe's Villages. Here, we talk about homelessness, its causes, and solutions to the issue. Our guests include experts and leaders in the space, as well as folks with lived experience and unique perspectives on homelessness. If you'd like to learn more about our mission, visit us at neighbor.org and follow us on social media at Father Joe's Villages. If you've been following along, you know we've been exploring our pillars of care. These are comprehensive, solution-based approaches to preventing and ending homelessness. Our pillars include meeting basic needs, making health a priority, strengthening self-sufficiency, and the pillar we'll be discussing today, investing in children. Because of course, when we're talking about serving our neighbors most in need, it's not just men and women. It's hundreds of children who are experiencing homelessness every night. To join me in this conversation, we have three wonderful guests from Father Joe's Villages. Join me in welcoming Deacon Jim, our president and CEO, as well as Dana Derdarian, our director of residential services, and Nancy Restrepo Wilson, director of social services. Thank you so much for being Good morning. here. It's great to be with you. Welcome. Thank you. Can you start by introducing yourself and telling us what you do at Father Joe's? Okay. Uh, again, I'm Nancy Restrepo Wilson. I am the Social Services Department Director. And in this department, I oversee four different programs. One of them is the therapeutic child care. The second one is employment and education services. The next one is case management for clients that are transitioning into housing. And the last one is reviving the social work foundational internship component. Good morning, my name is Dana Derdarian. I'm the Director of Residential Services. I oversee all of the shelter beds at Father Joe's Villages, whether on-site or off-site, uh, to include those family shelters that we are going to be talking about today, which I'm excited. So we serve over 104 children every night. And I'm Deacon Jim, and as you mentioned, I'm the president and CEO of Father Joe's Villages, and I get to work with these fine ladies here, <laughs> and about 500 other team members. They make a difference in the, in the community, in the lives of individuals who we're blessed to serve, children included. And we'll be talking about children, be focusing on, on children and their parents as well, because we build family relationships. But what, what's unique about us and in this space of homelessness is that the comprehensive services, the continuum of care that we have. So anywhere from a shelter bed, right, and they're all different types of shelter beds, and we're blessed to offer over a thousand shelter beds in, in the community in, in various locations, all the way up to affordable housing. We build and we construct housing because, as you've heard me say before, the, the shelters don't break the cycle of homelessness. They help, and they're very necessary. We don't have enough shelters in this town. We need more shelter beds. But at the end of the day, a shelter is a temporary stopgap. Really, what breaks the cycle of homelessness is a home, something like St. Teresa of Calcutta Villa, that 14-story, 407-home facility that we have. That breaks the cycle of homelessness. And we're building even more of those. Why? Because the community needs it, the community that we serve. So, and everything in between. I mean, the million meals that we serve on a yearly basis, breakfast, lunch, and dinner in two dining rooms, right? These basic services, showers, that be, things that we take for granted, providing a day center for single men and women so that they can have some respite off of the streets at least during the day. Right? They're back on the streets at night, unfortunately, but during the day we get to connect with them and provide the services that they so desperately need. And then, as Nancy mentioned, there's employment. Employment is important, uh, and that's an important element as well so that people can gain self, self-sufficiency. self All the other programs that we have, our health center, federally qualified health center. If you don't have your health, how, you're not good for much of anything else, right? So, so health is so very important. Uh, substance use disorder treatment, uh, mental health challenges so that we're able to have psychiatric clinicians work with individuals. So that's a whirlwind of, of what we do as a whole. And it's, it's an aggregate, it's the comprehensiveness of these programs that it really helps to break that cycle. It's what makes a difference in individuals' lives. So they come to us for the full gamut of, of services. And the Investing in Children programs in particular, Father Joe's, I know are wonderful and I can't wait to hear about them. But I wanna start, if you could share a little bit about what may have spurred the creation of these programs. What challenges do children who experience homelessness face? Okay. Um, well, I came to Father Joe's about two and a half years ago. And I know that over the years uh, since Father Joe's um, started the programs, there have been so many incredible ideas. One of them is therapeutic child care, so parents could have 
the resources that the children need in addition to children themselves needing the special supports because if they have grown either in homelessness or in poverty, they come in with various challenges. And we want to break the cycle of homelessness by giving children an opportunity to break out of this cycle. Mm -hmm. And so therapeutic childcare was created precisely to provide the therapeutic components in childcare. And with that comes an array of services, including a therapist in the house. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have interns from a partner university, the Alliant uh, International University, that bring psychology students so they could provide classroom observations one-on-one -on -one support to the children, plus uh, parenting classes in addition to um, the parent and child dyadic therapy. So we provide all the therapeutic services in addition to the child care program based on the age levels. So we have classrooms from zero to two, uh, infant classrooms, toddler classrooms, pre-K classrooms, and now we're also offering after-school programming and summer programming as well. So it is an entire wraparound service mm -hmm. uh, component to support the children at all levels and mostly give them with a whole bunch of love and care, nurturing, and everything that they will need in addition to the resources that the parent will need mm -hmm. to understand what the child is going through mm -hmm. uh, in these challenging situations that homelessness brings in. Mm -hmm. And what I'll also add to that is Nancy's programs and the therapeutic child care also works with mothers that are expecting. Mm -hmm. So they're also working on prenatal care mm -hmm. and prenatal education because we do know that's so important and we do know that when out on the streets and experiencing homelessness, some, some of that prenatal care isn't taken care of, mm -hmm. right? Those doctor visits, the education behind why they need to go to the doctors and why they need to, to have that extra support. Mm -hmm. So the case management team, the therapeutic team brings that array of services as well for the, that mom that's expecting. Mm -hmm. I guess it can imagine the postnatal care as well. Of course, yeah. yeah. So a lot of the folks, I assume, that are staying in your shelters are accessing therapeutic child care, correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's the greatest point. And not only was the building designed when the Bishop Maher Center where the therapeutic child care is, there is an, a gateway, I would say, an, uh, a bridge mm -hmm. over from the, JK, from the Joan Croc Center mm -hmm. Uh, I try to not use those acronyms, uh, <laughs> from the Joan Croc Center over where the parents and the family stay, right over to therapeutic child care. So they don't even have to go outside. They can stay inside, and they can just walk their child across the bridge into the therapeutic child care. So there was so much thought behind how we were constructing these buildings to be able to support families um, in where they are at the time. Mm -hmm. So you're immediately removing one of those, two of those barriers, yes. finding affordable child care, getting your child to child care. Yes. So what are some of the other challenges that you've seen in the families in your shelters? So, you know, I, I think there's an array of they don't know how to, to get the services they need. Mm -hmm. We see some children that might need extra support that maybe a parent doesn't recognize, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe a child has some delays and really educating a parent behind it's nobody's fault, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Let's get that child that support early and often mm -hmm. so we can help immerse that child in the resources that they need to be as successful as possible. Mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned a few things. You mentioned mm -hmm. parenting classes, mm -hmm. these dyadic classes. Mm -hmm. What are some of the programs or special methodologies that you use to address the special challenges that the children and families face? In generally, we have a systemic approach to the work that we do. I call myself an ecological framework um, therapist. I used to be a therapist in my days. And this is why working with therapeutic child care is so important to me, because it is not just about one person at a time, one child at a time, but this system of support. That includes the case management, for example, and the residential staff. Everyone's hands really are um, on deck to support a child. So we have this amazing system at Father Joe's Villages where everyone is um, keen on supporting children and families. So we have this ecological framework where we intervene at every level mm -hmm. from um, 
assessments as soon as the child comes into the program. We provide them with assessments to understand where they are developmentally, socially, emotionally, behaviorally. Mm -hmm. The staff then, then create um, developmental plans or educational plans for the children. We pass that information to the families. So families hopefully will be able to work with their children on some of the areas that the kids need some more additional support. Um, we then provide classroom observations. We pull children out of the classroom depending on the kind of intervention that they will need, either play therapy, self-regulation therapy, um, or maybe pushing in the classroom, including things like um, learning the ABCs or learning the colors or maybe waiting for their turn to speak, some of the social skills that some of the children will need. Or just simply provide them with this one-on-one -on -one nurturing intervention mm -hmm. that would allow the child to come down, to learn to regulate the emotions, and to behave in a pro-social way. Uh, but that will take a long time. So from the beginning that a child comes to the program to the end, we provide them with these wraparound services that are related to the child but also related to the family. Then we find that sometimes some of the parents have a hard time connecting with their children. Uh, many of them have tremendous traumas that they come in. And you add the trauma of um, homelessness. Um, might create a distance between themselves and the child. Mm -hmm. So we provide these interventions where we do mommy and me or daddy and me interventions. Uh, we have a one-way mirror in, uh, in our therapeutic child care has state-of-the-art equipment yes. and wonderful resources created by wonderful donors that have come to um, Father Joe so we could have this level of interventions. So in one of the therapy rooms, a mother and child will be interacting. And the therapist is on the other side observing and then later providing the mother uh, with interventions, with ideas and strategies that she or he might implement with the child at home. Mm -hmm. And so those things are purposeful, almost methodical ways of supporting a child at all different levels. But then we also offer parenting classes, which is entering into a different level of uh, the social connection. And then we have other interventions, uh, like trainings for the staff, for example. Uh, recently, I provided a training on how the brain is impacted by trauma. So the better informed the staff is, the better they're able to serve the children in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And overall, it is about this loving, nur nurturing quality mm -hmm. that every child needs. Mm -hmm. And more so are little babies that have been traumatized by so many difficult circumstances. Yeah. The great thing I find, Nancy, is that the kids are so resilient. Yes. Right? You provide the right resources yes. and the compassion. It's incredible the way, the way they bounce back. Uh -huh. You see these kids that come in, they're so delayed at the beginning. They mm -hmm. don't, there's no socialization, no eye contact, yeah. no smiles. Yeah. Right? As a child that doesn't smile, I love the children. I have grandchildren. I love to see their smiles <laughs> and their giggles, right? They, that's the and, best. And when, and when that's, that's the best. And when, that's the best. And when yes. it's missing, when yeah. it's missing, you know there's something, there's something up, right? But, yeah. but it's incredible the work that your 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 team does there, the therapists. I mean, just and just applying the right resources. Mm -hmm. I mean, these kids, if they if we don't mitigate their circumstances, yeah. they're four times more apt to be homeless in adulthood. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think the people don't recognize that, right? That's why yeah. it's so important to get in there mm -hmm. so that they can be at peer level and then they can. They can compete and yeah. succeed and, and prosper. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And sometimes even children come in not with the sense of connecting with others, but also maybe connecting too much. They possibly didn't have good adults or role models, and the kids are stimulated all the time. Mm -hmm. And they find it very difficult to come down. We actually had a child that started out, um, could get pretty quickly into aggressive behaviors, biting, kicking, screaming, running out of the room. And I remember having a conversation about how this child will come in very quickly from zero to 10. And what we learned is that the child entered the program at a seven. Mm -hmm. He already started out with so much stimuli, mm -hmm. unable to regulate his emotions, and will go only three degrees in his own little mindset uh, pretty quickly escalating. And so it was a lot of work, all hands on deck, to support this child to be able to 
learn to recognize feelings and emotions or how to wait for the turn as opposed to just jump into the uh, going to the uh, playground for example and we have children that could be very clingy too that they don't know about personal boundaries and mm -hmm. so those are some of the things that we observe and we um, support every child depending on where they are right. and of course right. we have some of the kids that have a hard time connecting with people because they stayed in that stroller for a long time on the streets for example mm -hmm. who might have a hard time getting up because they were sitting down most of the time and it's all everything we do is about stimulating the little brain that is just beginning to develop mm -hmm. I don't know if everybody knows but our brains finish developing at the age of 27 mm -hmm. Are thinking that we're so smart at 25. <laughs> or at 18. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I cannot wait to be 18, right? right, right. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. and That's as we right. think about, we're talking about the children today, but we, we are also, when we look at adults, right, and the yes. family members, the parents, they're in survival mode when they're homeless, right? right? When they're right. experiencing homelessness, they're in survival mode. So a lot of times, as much as they love their child, their focus isn't on that child. It's where am I going to sleep tonight? What is that going to look like? Where are we going to get the next meal for my family? And so, at that point, then when the, the family is able to come into shelter, they're able to, that survival mode can help go away. We can help build that rapport with that family. That can diminish, and then they can really start focusing on that child. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no time for playing at the playground or oh. reading books when you're in survival mode. That's so important. So important. It absolutely is. And more and more families are falling into homelessness, right? The recent count, which is almost a year old at this point, we'll have another yeah. count in about six right. weeks or so. but. 45% more families falling into homelessness. Right. Incredible. I mean, including the children. I mean, a lot of children out there, the face of homelessness mm -hmm. has been has been changing over time. And you see these women, and, and Dana, I know you see them in your various programs. We should talk about those various programs, actually, because these women who, who especially are impacted, it's so hard to be homeless. And then when you're a woman, and then on top of it, if you have children mm. or if you're pregnant, Right, 44 percent of the of the women who are out there on the streets. I found this statistic really um, unbelievable. Forty four percent of the women who are on the streets are either pregnant or they have children mm -hmm. between them. eighteen and twenty. Right, so think about yeah. that. The, yeah. the, the the unique needs, and I know you have programs yeah. that address that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we were looking at different programs or program models, uh, what what is traditionally happening is a single female goes into a single female shelter irrelevant if she's pregnant or not, right? The way we look at our family shelters is you have to have a child in tow. You have to have a child with you to be able to come into a family shelter. But we really looked at it as where can we make an impact? We have these young individuals, 18 to 24, the TAY age, youth, transitional age youth, that are getting pregnant and you know up to the 44% um, more likely to be pregnant out on the streets. And we looked at it as this is an opportunity for us to try something different, for us to do something different with those individuals who are, are single, scared out on the streets, pregnant, 18, year, 18 19, 20 years old. Um, you know, I, I had my first child at 21, mm -hmm. and thank God I had family support. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot to learn. There was a lot of life still ahead of me, and there were a lot of things that I was fearful of. Mm -hmm. So to think on top of that, that somebody doesn't have that family support, mm -hmm. Somebody doesn't have a place to go or a place to live. So this was our, our opportunity to bring it all together and say, hey, let's create a program, St. Margaret of Coratana Harbor, that we are able to bring single mothers into this program or mothers-to-be. They don't even have, they could have a child in tow with them, mm -hmm. um, but as long as they're pregnant, we are willing to take them in. We are willing to surround them with other families because they're all on the family floor. So surround them with other families, show them what the family life is like and the kiddos and everything that comes with that, all the support on the residential side, and give them a place to really nest. Because as we know, in a single shelter, then they're gonna get moved to a family shelter as soon as the baby's born. And there's already a lot going on uh, for mothers out there that know how difficult it is to bring a brand new baby home as your first child, uh, let alone then having to shift to a different location and what that might look like and not knowing the individuals around you. So this was an opportunity to have everything in place for that mother, to have gliding, rocking chairs, and cribs set up and ready, and their room to have uh, comforters and sheets and blankets and to be warm and welcoming uh, for that individual to really be able to settle to, for that you know, 
instead of having that fight or flight, right, to be able to sit and not have to be in survival mode anymore. And that was made possible because it's private funding for this program, it, correct? It is That's correct. Funding. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It is. It was through the generosity of Cristiano and Adriana Amen. And Cristiano is the president and CEO of Qualcomm. And their generosity, I mean, they were just extremely concerned about women being on the street particularly, and then if they, they were pregnant. And just having, giving them options, right? Because a lot of times p- p- women who are on the streets and pregnant, they feel that there is only one option, right? Because they're struggling so much. So here, it gives them the option to, to really carry that child and, and be able to get the prenatal care and the postnatal care, as you mentioned. And, and, and see that child, I mean, and just be, be joyous. I know we, we, we've had, since we instituted yes. that program two years ago, we've had nine children born yeah. of a woman in that program. And yeah. it's just great to see. What kind of outcomes have there been? So the outcomes have been, you know, ac- across the board. I have a really great success story that kind of parallels the two programs is we had an individual female come into our St. Margaret's program. She was pregnant, about six months pregnant. Uh, we were able to surround her and give her the services that are needed. She was able to engage with case management. Um, and she had a healthy baby boy and um, brought that baby boy home back to the shelter and at that point, she decided that she wanted to be there with the father of her child. Mm-hmm. That program is aimed for single women. However, we also have other programs mm-hmm. within our Joan mm-hmm. Croc Center, one of which is our Family Empowerment Program, which I know we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but the family was able to move into the Family Empowerment Program wow. because the father was work ready. Yes. Wow. And they ended up reunifying with family and we know that, yes, it's great for people to move out on their own, but we know that's not always the case. Here in San Diego, it's one of the most expensive places mm-hmm. to live or the most expensive place to live now uh, based off of recent studies. But they were able to reconnect with family and they were able to move the two of them and their brand new baby back to family to stay and to help them guide them through those first couple of months of having a new baby at home. That's really great. And that's a good segue, actually, into the Family Empowerment Program. Tell us about that program. Yeah, Family Empowerment Program is amazing. It's, again, the way other shelters or the the nature of uh, the majority of our shelters look is uh, very low barriers. Uh, it's, It's kind of a blanket system across the board where everything kind of looks the same. And but but parents and individuals wanted more. They wanted something different. They wanted to be able to strive for something better. And this this opportunity came from the support of senior leadership. Deacon, you were part of that where we had open rooms and what can we do different? Mm -hmm. Um, And we decided to uplift those rooms, new flooring, different colored paint, um, and really focus art on the walls. Art on the walls. Thank you, Nancy, for bringing that up. Their own lounge area for those families and really focus on families that wanted to stay clean and sober, mm-hmm. that wanted to, to engage with work and or employment services mm-hmm. that Nancy oversees, and to really focus on housing. So we have 10 rooms available within our Family Living Center at the Joan Croc Center, and uh, those 10 rooms are dedicated for a family empowerment program, and they can stay for up to a year, and that's where that family moved into. Wow. That's really cool. So yeah. what are the differences? They they are, I know they're working on employment. They have to be clean and sober to stay at Family Empowerment Program, or? Yeah, so we, we ask them to stay clean and sober. Um, it's all, we're not doing any drug testing of any kind. Mm-hmm. It's just our conversation that we have with somebody mm-hmm. to stay clean and sober during that program. Uh, and then work ready or work able. Okay. And so if they're not quite working yet, that's okay. Uh, we're, they're work, working with employment and education mm-hmm. services mm-hmm. to get that support and the training that they might need to be able to get into the workforce. Okay. And also building savings. Mm-hmm. Many of them could be working, saving money, so they can afford to move to an apartment. Mm-hmm. And many of them are ready because they have an income, they have savings, to get out of the shelter system into their own uh, self-sustainable life, which Mm -hmm. is basically the goal that we all have here at Padre Joe's Villages. Yeah, and to that point, we had a mother with a young mother. She was in that transitional age youth uh, uh, age bracket. She had two young children under the age of five, and she was able to, she was able to not only get a job, 
maintain a job while she was in that family empowerment program, but then she was also able to move out into un unsubsidized housing. So housing with no subsidy, no mm -hmm. Section 8 voucher, was able to find housing for her and her two children. Which is great. Yeah. Which is great. Do you see that the availability of the Family Empowerment Program motivates the other folks in the Family Living Center to that's, that's take that? Yeah. Well, that's a goal, and I believe that the program was created because it is an option for many families that are ready to move away from the system and into their own home. Mm -hmm. But it was also created to provide others an incentive for them to be motivated and say, I want to be in those uh, rooms. I want to be using that lounge. I want to be able to get out of the shelter system. Mm -hmm. So it is really the more families that get to exit the family empowerment program and others that get to be into the family empowerment program, and that's how we measure our, our success. They are being motivated mm -hmm. to get out of the shelter system into a more supportive service. Yeah, and, and to that point, that's a great point, Maggie and, and Nancy, is because we strategically put those family empowerment rooms mm -hmm. right, right next <laughs> to, yeah. right in the middle, and that community room has a, an array of windows surrounding it, so you can look in, but it's right next to that bridge that I was talking about yeah. earlier to get to therapeutic child care, and there's art on the walls like Nancy was talking about earlier. It's very beautiful and very relaxing, mm -hmm. and so then that way folks, when walking through, can be like, what is this? What is this over here? I want to I want to come here, mm -hmm. and it's a perfect opportunity for us as residential staff, mm -hmm. for Nancy's team and case management to be able to talk to those folks about what that looks like. And it points to the uniqueness of our programs, mm -hmm. and it's not a one size fits all. And Correct. this is a perfect mm -hmm. example of that. Mm -hmm. The genesis of this program was because we were listening to those that we serve, and they were clamoring for this type of a program. They wanted a sober living area. They wanted, mm -hmm. and a lot of them have been. In, in substances before. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to be around that element, right? So we were being responsive right. to them and meeting them where they are, and that's mm -hmm. so very important, right? So that's the genesis of this program, and that's what we hope for others. That said, most of our, of our beds are, are not sober beds, right? Most right. of our beds, again, being responsive to those individuals mm -hmm. who are at different points of their journey out of homelessness, and they still need that other support. Some of them may be on substances, right? But we, hey, we're here for you as well. Mm -hmm. That's the uniqueness of uh, about Father Joe's villages, right? We meet people where they are. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And we basically share the same families, the same children, mm -hmm. uh, but we serve them in very different ways. Whereas uh, Dana's department serves the families in, in the shelter, we serve them through case management, employment, and therapeutic child care. Mm -hmm. And the case management component, part of the social services department, it's very unique. We don't have like a cookie cutter approach to serving the clients. Every client comes with very different sets of challenges and expectations and goals for themselves. But the goals of Father Joe's Villages are to help them with gaining employment, savings, and going into their own homes, getting out of homelessness. And so we tailor the case management based on the family's needs. And for the families that are in therapeutic child care, it is all about connecting them to the program, but also connecting them to the therapeutic services within the program and even outside with behavioral health, recovery services, the medical clinic, um, but also is a, um, a two-way communication with the residential staff about the needs that the clients may have, about the needs of a child, providing them with resources out there in the community, uh, referrals for evaluations or for additional opportunities that they will need, mm -hmm. including taking them to the employment and education program for them to be able to have training and save money and work really closely with the case management for them to be able to um, meet the goals that they have for themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's a very comprehensive, mm -hmm. all again, all hands on deck of all of us at different levels uh, with different staffing um, possibilities to support all the needs that the clients come in with, especially the little ones. Mm -hmm. right. And as was said before, with the uniqueness of this program and, and our, some of our other programs as well, philanthropy is what comes into play, right? Because a lot of these types of programs are not uh, government funded, right? Mm -hmm. So Correct. that's where philanthropy, I mentioned 
the generosity of Cristiano and Adriana Amen, mm -hmm. and then others who step up as well, right? Because we talk to them about, mm -hmm. about these types of programs, they get so excited, right? Because mm -hmm. they know they can make a difference mm -hmm. in the lives of individuals, and then they, they, they support us, right? They support us in our efforts, and it's great trying different things. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially because our staff, our frontline staff, they see what the true needs are. You know, the public funding is wonderful. We need it. You know, we need to reach as many people as possible with those low barrier shelters. Yeah. But we identify these real needs, like the needs of a pregnant woman or the, you know, sober living beds. Those are real needs. And so thankfully to the generosity yeah. of our donors, we're Truly. able to explore that. If we didn't have some of this private funding, at therapeutic childcare, we wouldn't be able to do some of the things that we're beginning to do now. We are going to hire a part-time speech therapist because we, the field outside, the kids would have to go through tremendous waiting list. Not only we have to work with the families for them to finally warm up to the idea that maybe my kid is having some delays and to be able to refer them out and they're ready to receive the services, but now they get into a big waiting list. Mm -hmm. So now we should be able to evaluate the children and serve them in-house as we are beginning to assess them mm -hmm. uh, instead of having them wait a long time, up to almost six months, mm -hmm. for them to be able to receive mm -hmm. speech therapy services. Mm -hmm. But we also have some other partnerships with other organizations to be able to evaluate our kids too. But being able to provide that mm -hmm. service in-house, it is because of the generous donation mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. some and of our wonderful funders. And not to mention the special care and attention that yes. they have because you know, of our familiarity with the population. Yeah, yeah and Great that's point. where the collaboration between mm -hmm. the two teams comes together, right? Because there's a lot of times where case management isn't seeing everything that happens throughout the day. There's res residential Fortnite. staff is 24 seven, mm -hmm. 365 days a year. There's no mm -hmm. day that they have off, right? And so they're really able to engage with those families when they're having those concerns. Uh, parenting, when a, when a parent is maybe frustrated with their child mm -hmm. and not making the best decisions in the mm -hmm. moment. Um, if they're seeing delays that maybe case management wouldn't necessarily see in, in an hour session. Mm -hmm. So really being able to collaborate and work closely together on what that looks like. Okay. It's critical, it's critical. And I know we've been having a lot of holiday events <laughs> as of recent. Yeah. Did you wanna share what happened just this morning? Yeah, it was amazing. So the Ladies Guild uh, comes together every year to support our little ones over in our shelters. So we have a, currently we have 104 little ones under the age of 18. Um, and they, the Ladies Guild gave a specific amount of money, a pretty good amount of money uh, per child to go shopping. So what happens is the Ladies Guild supports a chartered bus. Uh, we, we pick a local Walmart in National City. This is where we went this year. And uh, the parents, uh, one parent per household gets on the bus at 5.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Therapeutic <laughs> childcare opens up early to be able to support mm -hmm. those kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, parents get on the bus. There were 18 families today. We'll have another round tomorrow of 21 families that'll get on the bus. Mm -hmm. uh, for those families that are working or not able to come, we'll shop for them. So they create mm -hmm. their list. Uh, they get paired up with a Ladies Guild member. Uh, if they, we had Spanish speaking Ladies Guild members for those families that spoke Spanish, primarily, mm -hmm. primarily Spanish and they were out and about all over the Walmart. It was so fun to watch those families get in line. Uh, Deacon, it was so fun to even watch the cashiers that get so excited about uh, getting down to that last penny and making sure those kids got every little knick-knack and gift that was on their list. I, I, it's great. You know, so, uh, so I'm gonna take the opportunity for some shout, shout outs. One mm -hmm. to Walmart. Yeah. As you mentioned, yes. they do a great job by us. I mean, they really, it's not just making it available. I mean, they, as you say, even the cashiers get into it, right? Uh, they all, from the management down. Best and best so I'm, re I'm really happy at, at, at that and, and appreciative of Walmart and, and their efforts in this regard. And the Ladies Guild, my gosh, the Ladies Guild over the years, 40 years now, yeah. they are there for us. I mean, at, at events, especially for the children, this is a prime example for birthdays of children's and so forth. They're just there constantly for us. And and, and, and it's great to have them. Any opportunity that I get to spend, it, uh, spend with them, it's, it's time well spent. So, so a shout out to them as well. It's, great. It's, a, it's a wonderful event. Then they came back and didn't they wrap the gifts this morning afterwards yes. in the village? Yeah, yeah, yeah. they yeah. wrapped the gifts. Um, and 
they wrap the gifts. They help wrap the parents come down. They help wrap the di- the gifts with the parents, mm-hmm. and uh, they have some sandwiches and hot cocoa and things of that nature. So uh, to go back a little bit, I think because I use acronyms so much, and and I wasn't really thinking about it as we're talking on this podcast. People are probably wondering what the Ladies Guild is. Right. So so as we go back, the Ladies Guild is a Catholic organization that comes together to be able to support. Uh, folks in need. Mm-hmm. So uh, they they have worked with us, like you said, for a long 40 time. Years. 40 years. And they're specific years. to Father Joe's Villages. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they, so, yeah. So it's a Catholic organi- organization. I, you, think I mean, you don't have to be Catholic to be in it, but it was, it was the genesis it's was back when Father Joe first started. Mm-hmm. I mean, he gathered a couple of ladies, and now it's 200 strong, right? So it's a, a, and they're they're everywhere. a force. They're a they force. even support the clothing closet that we have available in the employment and education program right. for clients who are ready. The dress for, for success, right? Yeah, the dress, mm-hmm. yeah absolutely. Yeah. They, they are great all over partners. the village. You're, you're yeah. absolutely right yeah. in a great way. Yeah. yeah, so I guess another shout out also is to Sundance. Sundance came through for their chartered buses and gave us a huge discount, just a couple hundred dollars a day for a bus, for a huge charter bus with right. their driver. So it was really great for them. And this is not their first time doing this for us. Right. Yeah. Right, We've right. done this multiple right, right. times before COVID. It's a testament to what we do, what you do every day. It's infectious. You know, this yeah. involvement, these special events, it's not something you can buy at a store, that feeling that you get when you're giving back, when you're helping, when you're part of the solution. Yeah. So that's wonderful. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. But we, I'd love to share, by the way, as part of these podcasts, I'd love to share stories, right? I know you have loads of stories. <laughs> if you have one or two you want to share with us about individuals you know that don't mind their names being used and so forth that was so i know that some that come to my mind but i'd rather that you share them for instance i i think of amber right the story of amber i don't even want to share the story of amber you want to pick up on amber or amber I, has been in every program at father joe's basically <laughs> yes she is in the family's team has been part of the residential program um has two daughters in therapeutic right. child care and um, studied out very nervous herself about sharing of her life. Now I believe she's one great spokesperson about the services that Mm. we provide. And uh, she, I understand, I believe that she also receives other supports, wraparound supports, not only about therapeutic childcare, but her own supportive uh, services with therapy as well, employment. She has been connected with our employment program was she in the cup instruction program? I'm trying to remember the she, culinary she arts. She was the uh, peer support specialist. Peer support specialist. Right. That's right. the one. Yes. That's yes. the one. She's, she graduated. She's so she proud can. because she wants to be a peer support yes. so that she can support other other individuals yes. going through the same thing. And and if, and it dates back to the fact, fact that her parents were yeah. addicted to substances. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so she got addicted to substances. Just before she finally had that breakthrough, mm-hmm. she overdosed on the street. Yeah. Right, fentanyl, it took six naloxone dosages mm-hmm. to bring her back. Think yeah. about that. But it revived her. And then her husband came down with a number of strokes. And we supported the husband. She's mm-hmm. so, I mean, she is someone who's so appreciative mm-hmm. of Father mm-hmm. Joe's Villages yeah, because, like you said, she's touched pretty much every program. Yeah. And her husband has passed mm-hmm. at this point in time. Mm-hmm. I mean, but, she, but she really, she lost her children. Now she's regained her children, yeah. right? And she's a great mom. She yeah. really is a great she's mom. She's incredible. But she's committed. And, and she just said, if not for Father Joe's Villages, her, her children would be orphans now, yeah. is what she yeah. says. So she's, she's incredible, incredibly appreciative. And yet, she's the one who's done it, right? I mean, yes. she's a strong yes. woman. I mean, yes. she really is. And we've p- provided the resources. But I, but I tell her how proud I am of her, right? How proud we are of her because she's tapped those resources. And it, it was hard for her, as you can imagine. Of it was very hard. Recovery is... A- very difficult, especially when you have so much trauma. And I believe she made a commitment the last time that she came to life, that her kids will not go through what she has gone through. Right. She's an incredible partner at Therapeutic Child Care. She participates in almost everything that we invite her to because it is important for her children. Right. She's a very committed parent and a great role model for many other mothers out there. But you see how things turned around with Absolutely. the right resources, yes. right? Yes. But she was lost. Yes. And and one of the things she says about Father Joe's Village, she says many things, but one is that we didn't give up on her because it wasn't easy and there were lapses, yeah. right? And that's the yeah. thing, you don't give up, right? Yeah. You, you you stay with individuals and they're yeah. on their journey. Yeah. Beautiful testament as to how you can break the cycle of homelessness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, really yeah. is. And really it's, is. it's a true testament also that 
people get to in in shelter people get to gain their name back right they're so lost in the system of just another number just another Mm -hmm. statistic Mm -hmm. we're able to build that rapport with folks and be able to give them their name back be able to make them proud of who they are and what they're doing and what they're here to accomplish Mm -hmm. getting their children back whatever that might look like for them to move forward in a positive manner right right beautiful it is beautiful. Well, thank you so much, not just for your time here, but for the really, truly meaningful work that you do every day. Absolutely. And there is so much more to talk about. Right? There yeah. is. Oh, I know we could go, go on. Could go on, on. I I yeah, yeah, I really yeah. do think we're the blessed ones to be able to be here, to be able to support our teams, to 100%. be able to watch those children yes. grow and thrive, and, and the adults, yes. right, to try something different. Mm-hmm. This is an opportunity that they've had that hasn't been working for them necessarily in the past, and they get to come in and try something different. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for listening. Our next episode of Neighbors Helping Neighbors will feature our Strengthening Self-Sufficiency Pillar of Care. We'll explore our education and employment services, our CAPS program, our STEPS program, and our beloved culinary arts program. We'll see you then. How are you going to get involved this year? Look for our year-end match campaign that doubles the impact of your donation. All donations will be matched dollar for dollar up to 250000 You can make a difference by donating cash, volunteering, donating home goods or clothing, shopping in our thrift stores, or engaging in plan giving. Take action today at neighbor.org. We are all neighbors helping neighbors, and together we can do better.